Imagine it's 1966 and you're living in East Berlin. Five years ago, the central government built a wall to prevent you from leaving the Eastern Bloc. By now, you've had enough of life in the GDR and want to flee to freedom with your friend Kurt. Here's the problem though. Overground, GDR leadership has set up unassailable defense mechanisms to prevent the so-called Republikflucht. The escape to the Federal Republic of Germany, aka West Germany. Two walls, thousands of soldiers and a strip of sand filled with treacherous surprises convince you not to take the overground route. Luckily, you've heard some whispers about another way to flee to West Berlin. A handful of people successfully crossed the border deep underneath the wall. They took the risky route through Berlin's infamous U-Bahn tunnels. Now, justifiably, you might have a few questions. Why are there U-Bahn tunnels connecting East Berlin and West Berlin? The answer is pretty straightforward. The first line of the Berlin U-Bahn opened in 1902 between what was then Stralauer Tor, today called Osthafen, and Potsdamer Platz. Fittingly, that line largely corresponds to today's U1 line. Up until 1961, a large network of lines connecting all parts of Berlin had been created. But on the night of August 13th, the fortunes of one of the world's most impressive metro networks would rapidly change for the worse. Hours early on August 12th, the infamous Maron Command ordered the complete blockade of West Berlin. Leading up to 1961, two and a half million people had fled from the GDR to West Germany, leaving the East on the brink of economic collapse. In a cloak and dagger operation, the people's police, paramilitary groups and the military arm of the Stasi began securing what was until that very night the open border between East and West Berlin. At 1 am, right after the Berlin U-Bahn ended its operation for the night, the East Berlin U-Bahn Control Center announced new endpoints for lines A and B of the network. Both lines ran from west to east, making them rather easy to split in two. West Berlin trains on line 1 were to end at Gleis Dreieck now, and line 2 trains now terminated at Schlesisches Tor. The People's Police Forces and special units started barricading tracks beyond those stations and shut off crucial rail facilities. Things get really spicy when we look at the north-south lines though. As you can see, transportation planners from decades past had little regard for the eventual division of Berlin. Line C's and D's endpoints are in West Berlin, but both lines run right through the eastern sector. For just a couple of hours on the morning of August 13th, a similar solution to that of lines A and B was imposed, with trains ending at the last station before the border. However, West Berlin authorities quickly realized that cutting off the city's vital north-south artery was not sustainable. The east's and west's transport authorities therefore negotiated a compromise. Lines C and D would be able to continue to operate with one obvious catch. GDR leaders weren't just going to let their citizens buy a ticket to Moritzstraße and say Auf Wiedersehen forever. Therefore, all but one station in the eastern sector were closed down, with trains not allowed to stop anymore. West Berlin trains had to pass through all East Berlin stations at slow speeds, with passengers looking out at the creepy and dimly lit stations. That very sight inspired a new, original German word. Geisterbahnhöfe. Ghost stations. What most passengers on those trains did not realize, their transit underneath East Berlin was a lot more dangerous than they could have ever imagined. To prevent anyone from escaping the East through the U-Bahn tunnels, all emergency exits had been sealed with bricks. Now keep in mind that the trains in use back then were pre-World War II models. Models which had a much higher chance of catastrophic fires breaking out due to inflammable parts than today's rail stock. Fortunately, not a single fire broke out and not a single fatal accident was ever recorded. One reason for this was that the West Berlin Transport Authority no longer allowed trains with even the slightest damage to pass through the East Berlin tunnels. Stopping in the eastern sector was to be avoided at all costs. In the rare case where that would be inevitable, drivers were not allowed to get off the train. Being mistaken for escapees by transport police and border guards in the tunnels would have been incredibly dangerous. The only thing that would have somewhat de-escalated those situations, unlike at all other parts of the border, guards were not allowed to shoot at sight inside the tunnels, with GDR leadership citing the risk of ricocheting bullets as the sole reason for the restrained use of force. Here is another special rule, implemented by the West Berlin Transport Authority BVG. If you were wanted by East Berlin police forces for whatever reason and ended up on U-Bahn line C or D and forgot to get off at the last station before the border, there was still a way out. Just pull the emergency brake. 
Here are the rules the BVG had for that scenario. In the event that the emergency brake is applied by a passenger after departure from the last station in the west sector, and the train still comes to a stop along its entire length in West Berlin, it must be ascertained whether the reason for the application of the emergency brake could be the unintended transit journey through the eastern sector. If the passenger confirms this and refuses the transit journey, the passenger must be given the opportunity to return to the last station on foot, accompanied by the train attendant. This regulation was written for groups who were recommended not to take the transit journey. For example, high-ranking politicians or people that had previously fled the GDR. Fortunately, this was another scenario that never materialized, as the East forces never stopped or checked any trains. The existence of the regulation speaks to the uncertain political situation and constant fear of the Cold War escalating. Let's talk about money for a second. All those transit rides came at a steep cost for West Berliners. The BVG was using exactly 7921 meters of track that were controlled and maintained by the BVB. In tough negotiations, the BVB made sure the rich West would send them a good chunk of valuable D-Mark. Inflation adjusted for today, the BVG paid about 4.5 million euro per year to use the track starting in 1961, with that amount being raised every year from the year 1970 onwards. In 1989, the BVG ended up paying one last ginormous bill of almost 12.5 million euros for that year. That would be more than 34,000 euro per day of operations and 43 euros and 15 cents per meter per day. Let's finally get back to the escape of Kurt from the beginning of the video. Thank you by the way for watching until now. I do know that my voiceovers need a lot more work, but that's why I appreciate so much that you're still watching at this point. Let's let's continue. Kurt B and Dieter K tried to escape the East on the night of October 3rd, 1966. First, they broke into the closed down U-Bahn station Schmidtstraße. They broke through the walled up entrance and destroyed a rolling grill and other barriers. All in all, it took them four days and nights to finally reach the tracks, which speaks to how heavily barricaded and secured the ghost stations really were. Finally on the tracks of Line D, they made their way south towards Moritzplatz. About 100 meters away from the underground border, Kurt and Dieter unknowingly stepped on a footboard on the tracks that was equipped with a signal contact and triggered an alarm. Two groups of border guards stationed at nearby Heinrich Heine Straße came sprinting after them. Both Kurt and Dieter were captured a mere 25 meters away from the border. They were sentenced to multiple years of prison time. This right here is where they would have crossed the border to freedom had they just been a tiny bit luckier. The end of Berlin Ghost Stations came with the peaceful revolution of 1989 and German reunification. In the days after the German people regained their freedom to travel from east to west and west to east, the border crossing at Friedrichstraße was completely overloaded. Planners quickly chose Janowitzbrücke to be the first GO station to be reopened. The station was easy to open as accesses were comparatively quickly reconstructed and easy to clean up. It was also on line D which had significantly less traffic than line C but at the same time the capacity for 6 cars to stop while line C only had a maximum capacity for 4 cars. On top of that, Janowitzbrücke offered a transfer option to the Stadtbahn, taking a significant load of Friedrichstraße. On the morning of November 11th, 1989, by coincidence, the 70th birthday of my great-grandmother, Janowitzbrücke was opened, marking an important day in maybe the proudest chapter of German history. 28 years after the wall was built, Germans were finally able to travel freely again. You've made it. Thank you so much for watching. For more videos just like this one, please subscribe and help me hit 7000 subscribers.